Welcome back, Shaloners. Happy Mother's Day. Today is Mother's Day, and Mother's Day means something kind of different for all of us, which is difficult because society tells us it's only supposed to mean one thing. It's the day we celebrate mom. And if you are lucky enough to have your mom with you and have a good relationship with her, that is what it means. For some of us, it it's a day of mourning because our moms aren't here. For some of us, it's a complicated day because we don't maybe have a good relationship with our mom. So maybe today is a day we celebrate surviving our relationship with our mom and moving into our own individuality and independence. But. We're going to talk today a little bit about how to reparent yourself and how to be the mother you have needed using some tips from a doctor who I am obsessed with. I'm obsessed with her. We'll talk about it. But we're also going to break down a documentary from our great spiritual mother, Michelle Obama. Her book, Becoming, has been out for, I don't know, I think two years now. Gosh, that seems like a long, longer than I thought. But she recently released a documentary on Netflix, kind of chronicling like bits of her life, stuff that she's learned in the White House, some excerpts from the book, and it's all kind of woven together with like the process of her book tour and, and how that kind of came about. It's a little behind the scenes. So I watched it. I cried the whole way through, the whole way through. I had to watch it alone and just be, I'll probably cry in this video. PMS is a wonderful thing. <clears throat> so we're going to break that down for some of the lessons we can take from that because I mean, the truest thing I ever read was when someone tweeted that they just want someone to make an app of Michelle Obama saying it's going to be okay. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I feel this on the deepest possible, possible level. So we'll break it all down. But before we get started, just want to remind you that if you have a question for me, want to talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, head to my website, shallonlester.com and click help. Also, if you want to book a video shout out, get a question answered that way. If you want to send a Mother's Day greeting or a birthday greeting to a friend or pep talk for yourself or anyone else, find me on Cameo at ShallonXO. And be sure to connect with me on Instagram where I let you guys weigh in on a ton of different topics. I'm always asking for your input on, you know, what the topic is and what the messaging is. So definitely connect with me that way. I love it. Oh, oh, and I'm wearing, I want to give a shout out to a small business that I reached out to because I love their stuff. And I was like, hey, I love your things. These little rings are by Vault. I'll, I'll tell you about the rings in a second. And these earrings, Vault Jewels, V-U-L-T. And Vault, uh, yeah, like I've worn their stuff and I love it. And I love these sort of like eternity band rings because Haley Baldwin wears them. But hear me out, not just because she wears them and I'm just like some blind lemming doing whatever she does, but like I've always loved it when women would wear these, but they typically, I would always see them with like a wedding ring, like they were a wedding band. And I was like, oh, I can't just wear like a wedding band. Like that's weird. But then I saw Haley wearing them and stacking them. I was like, it's a whole new world. It turns out I can actually wear whatever jewelry I want. And so Vault is definitely my favorite. Um, they're wonderful. And so the owner sent me just this super sweet note when she said that she, and she said, if you guys wanna buy anything from the site, V-U-L-T, Vault Jewels, uh, you get free shipping if you use code NYC AID, A-I-D, and 20% of the proceeds goes to New York City's Health and Hospitals, that's NYC HHC. And this is what Diana had to say. She said, my mom is one of thousands of healthcare providers at NYC HHC, and this fund goes towards their meals, hotels for quarantine in case they're exposed, scrubs, PPE, et cetera, all the good stuff they need at the moment. Hope you stay hate, safe, healthy, and sane, LOL. Love you, Diana. So sweet. So go shopping, treat yourself, treat your mama, even if you know the Mother's Day gift is a few days late, she's still gonna appreciate it and do something good for other mamas out there and daddies keeping us all safe from coronavirus. So let's talk Michelle, let's talk Michelle. <sighs> this documentary, I would, I've never watched something that was so depressing and inspiring at the same time. Do you know what I mean? It was so deeply depressing because it's like, how the fuck did we let this Trump administration happen? How did we let this divisiveness, this hatred, and what Michelle and Barack have described as like tribalism, and I think that's so, so true. How do we let that happen after, after having people like Barack and Michelle in the office? Do you know Barack follows me on Twitter? I'm just gonna say it. You know I had to bring it up. Let's just get it out in the open. I say it all the time. Like two educated Princeton, Harvard educated, genius level people, good parents, they care about their community, they're, they work out, like they're just exemplars of American fortitude and the American dream. 
what happened? What happened in 2016? It's just, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed, you know? And so it was really hard to watch this documentary knowing that we like, we had it. You know, we had it for eight years. And we don't, we don't got it anymore. We don't have it anymore. You know, we're just, I think we're devolving as a society. Coronavirus is a fucking nightmare. Barack recently said it was like a chaotic mess. And like, yes, it is. Thank, yes, I'm glad at least like dad agrees that this is a mess and we aren't just like, going through this alone like he sees how difficult this is for everyone so it was hard to watch but it was of course inspiring because she michelle is such like a she is just such a she's such a pillar like she's so poised and she's confident without ever being smug or cocky and she's calming without being blasé and she's wise without preaching and she listens and she's connected she's just oh she's everything she's everything but she started out the documentary talking about the last day in the White House, not the first day, the last day when, you know, she was like trying to get up and out and I mean, move, you have a whole new presidency coming in. And like, that's, that's weird, you know, like, that's crazy. And the, she said the staff was crying and everyone was crying. She's like, I have to hold it together because if I walk out of there crying, people are going to think I'm crying for a different reason, you know, which the rest of America was crying for that reason. We got it. Don't worry. But she said once she got onto Air Force One, she sobbed. She just sobbed for like 30 minutes. I was like, 30 minutes? I've been sobbing for two and a half years. Like, okay, you were stronger than me. But she said it was the release of having to do things perfectly. And that was like kind of the first thing that struck me about this documentary. It's like, wow, that's so true. And I think that's something that certainly her in the position of being the first lady, like times 10 trillion. But I know that we women feel like this all the time. We got to do it perfectly. We have to be the perfect daughter, right? And Mother's Day's got to be perfect and the pancakes in bed and the gift basket and whatever. We have to be the perfect girlfriend. I hear so much from you guys, this concept that goes back to the mantra I've given you, which is, if it's fragile, let it break. Oh, I can't tell a guy I don't want to hook up yet. Oh, I can't tell him things are moving too fast. Oh, I can't tell him this. I can't tell, I can't let him see me without makeup. I can't say I've had a bad day. I can't, I can't, I can't. I have to be perfect or no one is going to love me. If it's fragile, let it break. And that's an elasticity we as non-first ladies have. Michelle didn't have that, but we'll get to that in a minute. So one thing that stood out to me in this documentary that ties into this Mother's Day thing is the relationship she has with her own mom. And I've seen this like on her social media and in interviews with her before, little kind of like hints about this, that her mom is just like, hashtag unimpressed, not super impressed. There was some, there was a, a Instagram post that like she had texted her mom from the Grammys and she said she had met someone like, I don't know, it was like Beyonce or Adele or something like that. And her mom said something back like, Oh, like they let you meet all the big stars? And she's like, I'm the first lady, you know? But like, I could feel, and so many of us could identify with that feeling of like, it's just never going to be enough, is it? I remember when I was in fourth grade, we had to do this biography and it was 30 pages typed, uh, like double, or no, 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 single space. It was single space. And I had the chicken pox super bad and I had a fever and I was like naked covered in calamine lotion, like typing away. I had to be a biography on someone famous. I did it on, and it was a scientist. I did it on Hitler and it was fascinating. Like, you know, I know like weird Hitler facts. <laughs> cool. Lucky me. But, um, and like my friend, did, she got gold in my ear and someone else got Winslow Homer. I was like, and I got fucking Hitler. Cool. <laughs> and, um, but I turned it, I was so proud of it, and I got an A minus. And this teacher was like the hardest teacher in, in our school. And it was like, even to get an A minus was like crazy. And I remember my family, the first thing they said was like, why the minus? I was like, okay, okay. I had a fever of 102 when I fucking wrote this thing, okay? I was like a, like a leper covered in spots. So we get it, we get it, right? And she brings this up in subtle ways, in jokey ways throughout the documentary more than once. One thing she said is, um, let's see, of course, of course the iPad's not cooperating, why would it? <clears throat> you know, she said at some point, like, I'm the first lady, like, what else do I have to do to impress you? And her mom just had this like, mm, 
whatever attitude like she showed her mom this cake of like that they made shaped like the becoming book and the mom was like oh you know that's nice it's like mom the house is packed she's like mm-hmm. but her brother craig michelle's brother is like oh the golden child and he's so he's so funny he's so funny and like you can tell he's he's just like the brother and he was something like my my sister every single person on planet earth knows who my sister is he's like no brother should have to experience their sister being that popular <laughs> I'm like, oh God, if I, I don't want siblings, but if I had to have one, I'd, I want to be him. But like Michelle and her mom, the family was all at Craig's house for dinner. And the mom was like, Craig, I want some of your wine. And Michelle's like, you always want Craig's wine. Oh, he's got the good wine. Sorry, I only give, gave you White House wine. No, we want Craig's wine. And it was just these little, these little moments that you're like, hmm. I see. I see. And Craig went to Princeton as well. He's older and he went to Princeton. I believe it was Craig Owens. I don't know if she has other siblings. I don't think so. But Michelle told the story that because her brother went to Princeton and she's like, okay, I'm going to go to Princeton too. And her high school guidance counselor was basically like, you're aiming too high. You're not Princeton material. Well, bitch went to Princeton. Actually, a guy I know, I mean, he's like an older gentleman. He went to Princeton the same time as her. And I, I love Giovanni. He's like, ugh. I love him. I just want to be sister wives or I don't know, something. I just, I need, I need him in my life more. But he was saying that he would like flirt with Michelle and he's literally a baron. He's like Italian royalty, royalty. He's a baron and a count as from two different sides of his family. And he was like flirting with Michelle and like trying to ask her out. And she's like, no. And he's like, okay, okay oh, you're right. So maybe we can just be friends. She's like, also no. <laughs> She just got like shut down by Michelle. He's like, I still love her. She's the best. But yeah, Michelle ended up going to Princeton. And it's like, I feel like so much of what she achieved was fueled by this need to prove herself to her family. And she talked about her grandfather and how her grandfather expected greatness. He expected greatness from them. And... And that was just like the standard. And that really resonated with me. Like my family expected greatness from me and all of my friends, like I've stayed really close with, I mean, my lawyer is my best friend from kindergarten. And because we all lived in this Irvine pressure cooker of achievement, you, and it's funny, it's like so many of my friends from like high school and elementary school, we don't have kids or we're not married yet. And it's because it's like, and our parents are like, well, why don't you have kids? And my one of my friends was like, because you raised a nerd. That's why I don't have five babies. You raised a nerd and nerds work. Nerds don't marry at 23 and stay home and birth. We get out into the lab. We get out into the courtroom. We get on YouTube. We work. And so it's it's difficult when you were raised for like, okay, you got to do this one thing, this one thing. And then society expects something for you or the parents kind of flip. And it's like, oh, well, why aren't you doing this other thing? You're like, what do you want from me? So I definitely get this pressure. And I, I personally am motivated by people telling me I can't do things and spite, you know, and that is a really good propeller, but that's all that should be. It should be just that initial push. You know what? You tell me that I'm always going to be fat. I'm going to the gym. You tell me that I can't write a book and I'll be back here begging for my job. Book deal in nine months with Random House. How about that? But it's like, it's a good push, but then you have to have your own positive and healthy reasons to keep going down that path. Like revenge and spite can't motivate you the whole way because then your achievement isn't about you. It's about someone else. And that's not healthy. But one thing uh, Michelle said that was really interesting is that how when she grew up and she grew up in Chicago South Side and she grew up in a time when there truly was a middle class. And if you're younger like that, that might not like mean something. But like back in, you know, the 60s and the 70s, you could work in a factory. You didn't have to have a college education. You could still buy a house. You could still have like a decent car for your family. You weren't like there wasn't the rich and the poor. There was truly the middle class. You could own your own dry cleaning business. You could have a bit. And that is evaporating. And especially what worries me about this coronavirus is the financial toll it's taking on people. Small businesses are getting absolutely screwed. And it's why it's eroding that middle class that has already begun to fall away in such an extreme and egregious way. And so we're gonna have the very poor and the very rich. And that is not how a healthy society can function, you know? But that's a whole other thing. But she was talking about how at her dinner table, 
she felt like she belonged and she was she lived in a black community you know her high school was was mostly black she didn't feel like she stuck out in any kind of racial way and she expected that feeling to go with her into life. And she was shocked when she went to Princeton and she was like one of the few black people. She even said her her college roommate moved out because her mom was worried that she was living with a black chick and she thought she was in danger. And you could hear it in Michelle's voice telling that story of like how unbelievable that was for her and how traumatizing and wounding that was. And it's disgusting. And I think the lesson here is like, now, Michelle was lucky enough to have a family that made her feel like she belonged and wanted her to be inquisitive and curious and high achieving. And that's not the way for some people. I know that that's not the way for a lot of you. It's, oh, you think you're going to go to college? You ain't going to college, Crystal. Go get me a scratcher. You know, it's that kind of dynamic. You ain't worth nothing. You just going to go work at Walmart like your daddy. You know, this kind of vibe where it's like, who the fuck are you to break out? And that comes from your mother's own insecurities. But we're going to talk about that later. We're going to break that down with the doc. And so it was hard for her to transition kind of into like the real world, the white world, and have just this like, this wave of, what do you, what do you mean you don't believe in me? And I experienced that. And I know all women experience that to a degree. I mean, I obviously am not a person of color. I'm like from the suburbs. I grew up, I, I know what my privilege is as much as I can know it, and I'm always working to know it more, which is why I travel a lot. Like, had I not traveled the way I did when I was a kid, we didn't vacation, we traveled. I hiked the Amazon, I've been to China, I was kidnapped in Africa. Like, I have I have lived, and I lived from a very young age, and it was really important for my mother to show me what actual poverty looked like, what actual hardship and struggle and oppression looked like, so that I would come back to Irvine and not be like, I don't have the cool jean jacket. She's like, do you wanna go back to Africa? Do you remember when you were held hostage? Okay, shut the fuck up about the jacket. But I know that from my own lens, like I grew up not thinking of myself, and this sounds weird, almost as like a girl. Like I was simply an achiever. Like before I was like a girl, you know, like, and I existed for boys and who am I gonna marry? I never grew up dreaming about my wedding or like having a baby. I grew up dreaming, dreaming about writing that book, winning that award, you know, conquering whatever. And I went out into the world and people were reacting to me like I was just a girl. And I was like, <laughs> what? I remember having a conversation with Max, like when we, my ex-boyfriend, when we kind of first started dating and he, he's a lot younger than me and he was trying to deal with like a situation at work and he was like in a meeting and he's like, no one was listening to me. Like they just kept like, bleh, like being condescending, like poo-pooing me because I'm young and no one would listen to me. And I was right. And he was just like undone. And I was like, you are going to outgrow that that's how people talk to me and women and women of color forever. And he was like, he would, he talked about that. I mean, forever. He's like, that was such a turning point for me. It had never occurred to me that that is your experience. And like, he's like, that shifted everything that I thought, how I dealt with my female coworkers, how I prioritized them over like the douchey white males and the powder blue button ups. Like I really, He's like, I fucking got it that day. You know, and it's, a, it's an evolving process, but that was a big shift for him. And it's like, welcome to hell. You're going to leave. We get to stay here. So I really, you know, felt Michelle on that in a lot of ways. And I know that you guys feel that way too. So it's like, how can we retain our sense of agency and power when the world is telling you, actually, mm, I decided that you don't have any. And this is kind of skipping to the end, but <clears throat> at the end of the documentary, a girl, she did these little round table talks with like, I think girls like black girls in high school, by the way, ladies of color, do you prefer the term black or African-American? And I try to ask like my friends of color this, and I get completely different opinions. I mean, New Yorkers always have opinions, so that's good. But like, I find the majority of my friends say, I wouldn't be called black. Don't call me African-American. I didn't come from Africa. I came from the Bronx. I came from Westchester. You know what? So, and, and that's not what I expected to hear. And so I'm like, oh, okay. So I'm just curious uh, how you feel about semantics, if you care, if you don't care. But so I tend to use the term black because that's what my black friends have told me that they prefer. But 
Anyway, um, so she was doing this round table with uh, like black teenage girls and one girl, she's like, how do you avoid just becoming like a statistic or basically getting lost in the crowd? You know, how do you set yourself apart and not just be like, I'm just one of many? And the subtext is, how do I become an individual? Becoming, right? How do I exert my own self in a world that wants to paint me in broad colors. She's just a black kid. She's just an angry black woman. She's just a dumb white bitch from the suburbs. She's just an Asian chick. She's an, oh yes, so subservient. She, whatever, fill in the blank, but society is always foisting these kinds of things on us. And Michelle said, um, she said, you need to ask yourself some things. You need to ask yourself, who are you? What do you care about? And what brings you joy? Three questions, who are you? Who? The world has its own opinions about who we are, right? The internet has opinions about who I am, but I know who I am. And that's why I don't feel compelled to like talk back. It's like, all right, you know, a dog will come and hump your leg thinking you're another dog. You don't sit down with that dog. You're like, hey, you know what? I'm actually, I'm not a schnauzer. I'm not, and here's why. And let me go into all this detail about how I'm not a schnauzer. You just keep it moving because the dog doesn't understand you, okay? You don't have long conversations with dogs. So who are you? Write it down. Keep a running inventory of who the fuck you actually are so that when life and society comes against you, you're like, that's not true. I'm actually not dumb. I'm actually not this. I'm not that. I know who I am. And then you have to create experiences that validate that. I'm a good person. Okay, well, am I a good person? What do I do that's good? Oh, that's right. I provided Christmas for my entire black Baptist church. Hmm. Oh, that's right. I helped raise $15,000 to get a black homeless mom off the streets and into permanent housing. Huh. That's interesting. So that's counteracting some negative things that we hear. What do you care about? People with interests are interesting and interesting people stand out. They're leaders. Because leadership is risk in service of authenticity. That's one of our mottos here. Risk in service of authenticity. No, I don't want to do that. That doesn't feel authentic to me. Oh, that's a leader. I'm going to stand up for this person even though this isn't somebody everyone is standing up for. Oh, that's a leader because it's authentic. And what brings you joy? We forget about joy a lot. We forget about passion, curiosity, childlike dorkiness. You guys email me a lot like, I don't know how to get the spark back in my life. And one thing I always tell you is, live your perfect 11 year old day. When you were 11 or nine, or to pick some year in your childhood that was a good year, that you had good times, things were going well, whatever it was. And think about what your perfect day would have been. Would have been gardening out in the yard and like digging holes and looking for worms, ice skating, baking, playing with your dog, throwing at a birthday party, going to the museum and looking at dinosaur bones. And try to incorporate that back into your life. Allow yourself one hour a week, just one, to get back to that dorky 11-year-old day. Allow yourself one child hour a week and see if that kind of shakes the dust off and gets you back to the true self that you want to be. Because then you're gonna get addicted to that feeling. And then you're gonna start magnetizing things into your life that create that feeling. We talked before in videos about confirmation bias, about how we pull ourselves towards situations and people that validate our most deep-seated beliefs. And a lot of times, those beliefs aren't healthy. You don't have any value, you don't have any worth. You're always gonna work at Walmart, Crystal. So we have to flip that script. We have to flood the algorithm with so much conflicting information that those negative beliefs are now the outlier. Those aren't the norm. Those aren't the majority. That's just a tiny thing. It's like we hear it. It's like, you're going to work at Walmart, Chris. But what we hear big and booming is I help other people. I set goals and I achieve them. I live a life of discipline. I floss every day. I take out the garbage without being asked. I'm a person to be fucking reckoned with. Right? That's how we stand out in a crowd. But Michelle said other stuff. She was talking about Barack. <laughs> Follows me on Twitter. <laughs> You would too. You would too. You would say it forever. You would too. She was talking about rough patches in their marriage. Well, she was talking about their relationship and how he was always like different. He was a very like serious young man. 
And she's like, that was very different for me to date someone like that. She's, you know, they were in college. She was like, or I guess they were, she was in law school. And she sounded like she dated fuckboys. I mean, right? And she was like, Barack made me want to be better. And I was like, fuck. How far have we strayed from that idea? I used to always say that I... I say that I used to say it because I didn't always live it. But actually, no, I did. I did. I did. I would always date people that I could learn from. I could learn something. I could learn about the music industry. I could learn about stock markets. I could learn about water polo. I could learn about something. They were kind of douches. I'm not saying they weren't douches and fuckboys. They were the majority of the time. But they, the reason I was with them is because they were interesting, they had interests and they had something to teach me because I was interested in growing and leveling up myself. And this is why I created a lot of hurt lockers. And we talk about hurt lockers. A hurt locker is a guy in which you store your hurts. And it's someone you just imprint on and you're like twisted about and you like cannot get over him. And a big reason that happens is not because this is someone we wanna date, it's someone we wanna be. It's someone we admire and we don't really know how to process that. So it comes out as like pfft, obsessive love. So these guys like, wow, he's a titan of industry. I want to be that. Wow, he's so dynamic and fluid on stage. I envy that, you know? And so Michelle, I think, sort of, I guess Barack was her hurt locker, but it worked out, you know? Like he made her want to be better. And we have strayed so far from that concept in terms of dating as women. And all we do is try to make the man better. We talk a lot on this channel about we are not rehabs for broken men. I am actually not a rehab center. That's weird, I'm a human. Huh, I can do a lot. I'm not going to, re I'm not fixing you. And my pain, my trauma is not the natural cost of a man's journey to self-discovery. Fuck you, nope, I'm not allowing that shit in my life, no. But it doesn't occur to us to say, how are you gonna make me better? Because in our last video we did about um, can you fix a man, we did one on Scott and Sophia, Scott Disick and Sophia Ritchie, and also we touched on this in the Ben Affleck Anna Diarmas video. It's like, we want to fix, fix, fix. I've never had a guy try to fix me. Never. I've never had a guy be like, hey, I found us a good therapist, let's go. Here's some issues you can work on. I read this book and let me help. Never. Never. And I have done that to almost everyone I've dated. Oh, let me help you. And I've been thinking about this and diagnosing and I come up with a plan. And I'm not saying we want to date someone who's going to try to fix us. That's codependency and that's whatever. But we should want to date someone who has something to teach us about life, who is maybe half a block down the road in terms of finances, how to recycle, like whatever it might be, like learning, travel, something. They should be an opinion leader and a curiosity leader in some fucking category right? Otherwise, we have to ask ourselves, what are we getting out of these dynamics? And if I look back on my history, the answer was nothing, nothing. I was getting a repetition of those confirmation buys. I was getting confirmation of a deep-seated belief. Oh, I don't deserve to be happy. I have to fix everyone else. I'm going to run away from my own problems. This guy's an emotional getaway car. And I, if I pour all of my energy into fixing him, I don't have to fix me doesn't lead to a lot of happiness as it turns out. It leads to a lot more therapy, but it leads to these videos. So I guess there's a silver lining. So I think we all need to start raising the goddamn bar. How is this man or this friend or this situation, how is anything in my life making me better? Is it making me better? Is it making me worse? I don't really believe in the concept of neutrality, except when we're talking about forgiveness, you know, like the opposite of love isn't hate, it's neutrality, yes. But in terms of like, if something's in your life, it's either doing damage or it's propelling you forward. You know, there's an old hippie saying, and I can never find the source of this. And if you guys know the source, let me know. You're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. And I really, really believe that, especially when it comes to politics and stuff in America, like we are, there is no neutrality. You're on some side of the fence. And as the saying goes, all it takes for evil to prosper is for good men to do nothing. You know, neutrality is 
an action. No answer is an action. So look at the things and the people in your life and ask yourself like, well, what are they bringing? Are they making things better? Are they making things worse? And if they're making things worse, why am I allowing this? What confirmation bias is this kicking up inside of me? What is this validating? And how can I flood my system with messages that counteract that so that the negative is no longer the majority? Another thing she said about Barack was that when they first had kids, she became resentful that he was still taking care of himself, that he was prioritizing himself. And she had to check herself and she's because she was like, I'm at home with these babies. Why are you going to the gym? And she's like, the problem wasn't him going to the gym. The problem was that I was blaming him for it. The problem was I wasn't going to the gym. So instead of dogging him for prioritizing himself and taking care of himself, which is what all human beings should do, because that makes them the better father, the better partner, the better son, the better everything, right? When we are whole, we can be a half of a whole. Dating isn't 100, I'm sorry, dating isn't 50 50, it's 100 100. And same with any kind of relationship, right? So when she's like, instead of blaming him for taking care of himself and getting mad, I took care of myself. I don't need him to shrink to make me feel better. That's what we call on this channel leveling, right? You got to cut someone else down in order to feel better about yourself. No, why did you just rise to that level in a healthy way? And she also talked about how they went to marital counseling. And she had the experience that I know a lot of us do, if you've ever been to therapy or something like that, where you go and you're, it's like you just want this therapist, you want this therapist to judge and be like, you are so wrong, Barack. And she was like, mm -hmm, yeah, tell it, T tell it, tell it. And then, and then she was like, but wait, why are you talking to me? I'm perfect. He's the one who's wrong. I was like, oh my God, that's, that's exactly how therapy goes because it takes two to tango. You know, if you're in an unhealthy dynamic, it's not just him. Let's say it is just him. He's completely evil and crazy. We know what's wrong with him, but what's wrong with you? Why are you still there? What are you saying to yourself to normalize this behavior? What are you saying to yourself to, that you deserve this? This is how love should be. You don't deserve any better, blah, blah, blah. The confirmation bias. So it's important to get a sense of objectivity about all this stuff. And last but not least, certainly last but not least, just in terms of Michelle, this is gonna be a long video, I just realized. She was talking about politics and how traumatic it was to become famous like this. I mean, I, I loved Michelle like from the jump. And so it was, I like forget all the hate that she got. And do you remember that like fist bump thing? And like, is that a terrorist symbol? It's like, what the fuck is wrong with you people? What is wrong with you people? Like she was so attacked and vilified because she was, she was a mouthy black woman. She was a black woman who had opinions and that's not gonna fly in racist ass America. It was just crazy. And one thing she said is they were attacking me because I was effective. I was out on the campaign trail talking just as much as Barack was, and they were attacking me because I was starting to become effective. I felt that. They attack you when you're starting to become effective. People don't hate you for where you are. They're not jealous of you for where you are. They hate you for where you're going. They're jealous of you for who you're going to be, what you're going to achieve, the books you haven't written, the podcast that hasn't yet blown up yet, the channel that will hit a million. That's what they're jealous of. That's what they're trying to minimize, not where you are. Mm -mm 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 -mm. So look around your life. And I hate this phrase, haters are motivators. It's like so like live, laugh, love. It just makes me crazy. But if you try to look at it from this Michelle point of view, okay, maybe that makes a little bit more sense now. And she said, you know, I was telling my story and I was being vulnerable and that was, I was just getting like, she was just like getting destroyed. And she's like, I stopped speaking off the cuff. I started working off teleprompters and you could see like in the video clips, like the shift in her, in her mood. She just seemed not defeated, but just so disappointed, like that full body disappointment, like we used to feel when we were kids, right? Just like, we can't go to the pool today, you know? And you're just like, oh, just sunk. And she was talking about, you know, people, now we call them trolls, but I mean, back then, like, and it, not even back then, it's not trolls, it's fucking newscasters, dude. You know, it's like journalists and it's sickening the way people talk. She said, if we say it doesn't hurt the person, uh, uh, okay, wait, if we say it doesn't hurt, like stuff like this and the criticism that she's faced and bullying, and I, I hate to apply the term bullying to an adult, but dude, it was. 
If we say it doesn't hurt, the person says, they were just joking, that was just politics. No, no, that changes the shape of a person's soul. Like that really affected her. And I mean, my God, you can see why. It's, it's unbelievable she's still standing. And one phrase we love from Michelle is, when they go low, we go high. And I've always hated that because it was like, I wanna go low too. Even when they go high, I want to go low, <laughs> like, you know? It's like when you're attacked or you're wounded or something, you don't want to go high. You don't want to go high. But Michelle acknowledged that. and She said, it takes energy to go high, and we were exhausted. And she tied that in. She segued into how disappointing it was that Black people weren't voting in the way that she had hoped that they would. And she's like, I'm not just talking about the presidential election. I'm talking about interim elections, why Barack didn't get the Congress that he needed. She's like, it was a lot of our own folks who didn't vote. And it felt like a slap in the face. After all of our work, they just couldn't be bothered to vote at all. That's my trauma. I never thought of it from that point of view. I'm like evangelical about voting. It's so fucking easy. And it's not even if you don't vote for president, people think like, oh, I just need to vote for president. Oh, local elections, who cares? Local elections are the most important because it's trickle up. If you wanna see real change in your actual community, you need to be voting for like the DA who's prosecuting shit, the sheriff, land development, trash abatement and recycling, like all these environmental things. And the way you do that, I mean, we can do a whole other voting video, but you look at who's supporting what bills because you look at these measures, you're like, I truly don't know which way I'm supposed to go on this. I like, I don't get it. If like a teacher's union, if a nurse's union, if an environmental protection group is supporting something, that's that's good. If it's like Roy Davis, oil baron, like that's bad. That's probably not gonna work in the public interest if this measure passes. But we can do a whole other voting video when the time comes. But I never thought about the slap in the face. Like she's putting herself in this line of fire and it felt like betrayal. And I was actually talking to Swati, my friend. She uh, she runs one of the WhatsApp groups. She's so sweet. And she was saying how she stuck up for someone recently and they like threw her under the bus. You know, she's like, I'm sticking up for you. And she's like, well, I don't need you to stick up. I'm fine. And she's like, okay, wow. When you stick your neck out for someone and to the degree that Michelle did, it's like, and then they can't even just vote. Just go there and vote. But they do want to still keep complaining about how the country's moving. Oh, that's 100% happening. Fuck the police, taxes are too high, blah, blah, blah. Oh, but did you vote? Oh, okay, okay, okay. That's great, that's great, perfect. I can see how that was difficult for her. And so I think the lesson there is be supportive of people who you have benefited from. And that sounds kind of obtuse. Like, well, yeah, I know. Okay, yeah, you do know, don't you? Of course you know. But do you act on it? And this is something we talk about to tie back into Mother's Day. Are you supporting people who have supported you? Are you supporting someone who you've benefited from? Even if maybe they're not perfect, they don't have to be, you're not either. So I really learned a lot from this documentary and I, you know, I learned that I just missed the Obamas so bad and I'm glad it came out when it did because right now our country is thinking a lot about, hey, we're, how are we gonna go in this next election? And I think we needed a reminder that, oh wait, we can have sane people in the White House. Oh wait, we can have empathetic, educated people who truly do want the best for this country running it. That would be weird. Remember? I remember it. God, I wish, I, it's like I almost wish I didn't. So now let's talk about moms. Let's talk about moms, because moms and daughters, the most complicated relationship on earth, the most complicated relationship on earth. And let me tell you something. I'm not gonna fix your relationship with your mom here in this video. It takes a lot. I really, really, really encourage you to get into some therapy because it truly is a lifelong battle, not battle, but journey to get a toolbox to deal with family issues and family relations. It's not easy and it doesn't happen overnight. It's not just like, bah. it's something that we must constantly, I don't wanna use the word combat, but kind of because it can feel like that. It can feel like constant bombardment, especially if we're here in quarantine. So I wanna to read to you, uh, I follow this this doctor, Nicola Pera. She is the holistic psychologist on Instagram. I love her. I love her 
her stuff. It's just, she breaks down concepts that are kind of high level into digestible ways to understand it, which is great. So <clears throat> she did a post like, it's never too late to be your own, to be your own mom and to be the mother that you needed. So this is sort of her, this was in her caption and it's, it's a lot of really good mantras. May we see our mother as a human being with her own unresolved trauma and inner child pain. Just to touch on that for a minute. I think the hardest part, it's like the gift and the curse of growing up and becoming an adult. You are forced to see your parents as actual adults, not just like mom and dad, but it's like, oh, like Nadine and Nicholas, like actual human people who made mistakes, who didn't always know what they were doing, but they were literally just trying their fucking best. And best means something different to everyone, right? Best is not a one size fits all thing. Their best, someone's best might be really kind of small because of drug addiction or past traumas or whatever it is. Other people's best might be Michelle Obama level fucking great. And we assume it's gonna be the Michelle. And then we assume if we don't get the Michelle, if we get the you're never gonna be nothing crystal, if we get that, we assume that it's purposeful withholding and a lot of times it's not. A lot of times it's not. People are usually doing the best that they can with the tools and the intelligence and the emotional IQ and the experiences all jammed up into one. And like, that's the hard part is seeing that your parents like kinda don't know everything and they don't always know what they're doing, but that's also the gift because you're like, they don't know what they're fucking doing. And when they were mean or when something was traumatic or they invalidated something, it wasn't on purpose necessarily. Like it wasn't this grand plan to fuck me up. Like it was just, man, they don't know either. They don't know either. You probably have annoying, irritating girlfriends. They're gonna become a mom one day too. And all that they are, not all of it's gonna change. Hopefully a lot of it will, but a lot of times no uncool teenagers and young people become uncool parents and nothing there's not just this magical shift we're gonna move on may we release her scarcity mentality by having the courage to to be seen and to create you're never gonna be nothing that's a scarcity mentality how could you branch out on your own how could you ask for more how could you believe that you deserve more that's her mentality it doesn't have to be our own we have the divine animal right to walk our own path there is no animal on this earth that stays with its mother its entire life well killer whales they stay in pods but they're allowed to do what they want they're killer fucking whales and whales are better than all of us but the natural order is you grow up you branch out you fly your own way you build your own nest you do things your own way and humans are like no we can't i have to live exactly like my parents did mm -mm. May we free the pain of her criticism by speaking words of encouragement, empowerment, and embodiment to both ourselves and other women. May we understand that when she engaged in relationships that harmed us, she was deeply struggling with her own self-worth. May we see her opinions as just that, not facts. Oh, wow. Wow. Opinions, not facts not facts. May we know that she can only give us the grace she has given herself. May we grieve all that she could not give us and accept our anger around it. We are allowed to be upset and disappointed. We are. Sometimes, you know, I grew up with a single mom and I have a lot of anger around not having like that perfect two-parent family when everyone else seemingly in my beautiful rich town had exactly that, even though I had a very comfortable life, our family did well. And it's like, at some point I looked myself in the mirror. I was like, who the fuck do you think you are? Like, what do you think life owed you, Shallon? You played the hand you were dealt and it wasn't a perfect hand. That's how it goes. And you're allowed to grieve it and you're allowed to be angry over it but you also are not only allowed, you're obligated to keep it moving forward. This is what it is, you know? Grieve it and don't keep going back to it. It's like, this is so unfair, this was so purposeful. No. May we witness her survival, I'm sorry. May we witness her survival mode and shamelessly call in abundance, cooperation, and self-trust. Mom is in a place of scarcity. Dad 
comes from a place of lack. I come from a place of abundance. I'm rewriting this generational script. This one, this one. May we see those who trigger us the most, may we see those who trigger us the most mirror her traits and use this to guide us in our healing. People who trigger us the most are mirroring our mother's traits. Do you guys think that's true? Think about what triggers you. Think about how that plays out in a family dynamic, right? May we breathe as she triggers the inner child within us and honor any boundary we need to establish with her. May we have the self-love to create those boundaries for ourselves and hold them even if her response hurts. What do we say about boundaries? The people who hate your boundaries are the people who benefited from you having none at all. And 90% of the time, that's family. And we don't want to believe it is. Our family, no, they don't care. You know, we don't need boundaries against these people. What a horrible thing to think. I have to put up walls against people in my own home, in my own life. You don't build a fence through your living room. You build it on the outside from people in the outside. Not always. Not always. And when we accept that as fact, again, it feels less personal and it feels less painful. It is simply now a fact of life. And we can start to do something with it. May we gain more awareness that the voice in our head is primarily her voice and that we are welcome to question it. And then last but not least, may we know that as adults, we always have an opportunity to mother ourselves. This is our liberation. This is like going to make me cry. I just... uh, Even... uh, It's so much. It's so much. We talk about this concept of mothering ourselves a lot here on this channel, but we don't call it that. We call it something else. We call it being a warm-blooded animal where like we think we have to get all of our self-esteem from the outside world and I need validation. I need a boy to like me. I need this job to say that I'm good. I need my friends to tell me that I'm popular and that I'm thin. No, girl, we got to do that from within. This is an example I use all the time. If you could print money at home, like actual real money, would you ever go out and get a job? Be like, here I am at Big Lots to apply to be a bag boy. No, you would not. You would stay home and you'd print your own. What if we could print self-confidence? What if we could print dating ourselves? What if we could print mothering ourselves? What if we could engineer this in here instead of trying to get it outside? Not like we have to be this like Buddhist monk sitting on the side of a cliff and we never need anyone else in our lives. Of course not. But if we can fill in like the deep holes and the gaps or even just move a little bit towards doing that, then the things that we need from other people shrink dramatically. And then we get this objectivity to look at other people and say, I want you, but I don't need you. So you act up and you're gone. Whether that's a friend, whether that's a fuck boy, or whether that's a parent, you know? And this is our life's work, is to give those things to ourselves, to mother ourselves, to be our own boyfriend, to be our own best friend insofar as we can. So I hope that you guys got a little bit of lessons out of this. I love Michelle, please come back. I love that Biden is gonna choose a female for his running mate, but I like it broke my heart because I've been trying to manifest that he would choose Barack. Wouldn't that be the biggest plot twist? I don't even know if that's legal or constitutional, but it was what I was hoping for. And I thought maybe he'll choose Michelle. I don't know. (laughs) Oh, God. I don't know. I thought it would be our only hope. But I do have hope. I try to have hope and faith in this country and hope and faith. You know why I have hope and faith in this country? Because I have hope and faith in every girl that watches this channel. I know that we are all strong women. We all truly want to be better. If you're here on this channel, it's because you want to level up. You want to be better. You don't just like talk about it. I don't know. Like you really want to do the work. You want to, to be your best alpha self. So hopefully we made a little bit of progress today. And if this is a hard Mother's Day for you, just know that you're not alone. Please share your own mom stories in the comments below so that you guys can connect with one another and talk. And also I'm gonna be posting about this on my Instagram. That's also a great place to talk and comment and share and help one another. Michelle Entourage is always here for you. Happy Mother's Day, Shaloners.